the middle of winter, and I must tell you that I wasn't all that impressed in the middle of winter. However, this time, I was driving along the highway, and all that came through my mind was poetry. Poetry about, believe it or not, the wind turbines. How beautiful they look. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like totally, I don't know. There are a lot of people I know that hate wind turbines. But as you're driving along the 401, <coughs> There is something about that big, top blue sky and the grain fields and the turbines dancing. Um, I just thought it was very uh, beautiful. Now, that is not a statement about their effect on the environment. It's just, um, it, it was unexpected. It was unexpected to me. I wasn't expecting to feel that way about the turbines. You know, up in my neck, there was, um, there are a lot of people who don't want to I would be very interested afterwards to talk to folks about their opinion. I mean, after personally, but not in the question and answer. Um, I want to introduce myself because what I am most fundamentally is an advocate for native pollinators. I spend a lot of time talking about them because there aren't a lot of people who do spend a lot of time talking about them. And when there are a lot of people doing that, then I can retire. Um, so I'm hoping that you guys will take over my job. Um, native pollinators are uh, terribly, terribly important. But we don't have any human keepers. We have human honeybee keepers, but we don't have any human native bee keepers. And so they kind of, you know, being a, a self-centered species, we kind of forget the things that we aren't directly associated with. So that's, um, when I called my uh, my presentation tonight, A Lament for Native Pollinators, it was because I do have a poetic streak in me, and I do feel very badly. Every time I read the newspaper, you know, I hear about honeybees and their demise, and I'm a beekeeper also, so I love honeybees, and I don't want their, their demise to come. But I, um, I feel very badly because we're forgetting the bees that belong here. Okay, so I, I hope that you'll give me your attention, and I hope you'll bear with me. And if you have differences of opinion with me, I like differences of opinion because that's how I learn. So if I'm saying something which doesn't make sense to you, uh, I want to hear about it. Um, because if it doesn't make sense to you, then I'm assuming it's for a good reason, and I'm happy to learn. Okay, so that's where I stand. I don't uh, pretend to have all the knowledge or to be the grand expert. What I can do is tell you um, what has come out of many hours of thinking and um, scouring the literature, uh, both the media and the uh, scientific journals. Okay, so uh, we'll go from here, and I just have to figure out which way is for this. Okay, so before I talk about any of the other subjects that we're going to talk about today, uh, I want to just make sure that everybody understands what pollination is, because it's a word, you know, in the English language, you've got lots of We've got lots of words, I've got so many things I'm going to hold up to right here. We've got lots of words that we bandy around. And so I just want to make sure that we've got this word properly defined. So pollination is really, um, on the surface, is a very simple procedure. So you have the male parts of the flowers, the, the tip of the male part of the flower is the anther, and it is the part that has pollen on it, and the pollen is released. Okay, so there it sits. And then you have the female part of the flower, and the tip of the female part of the flower is the stigma, and it's a sticky kind of an organ, and its job is to receive pollen. The problem is that plants didn't think this through, because there's no way for the pollen to get to the stigma without an agent. And so the agent's job is to move the anther, and move the pollen from the anther to the stigma. So in Ontario, we have basically two types of pollination agents. We have wind. So all those crops like the corn and the grain that I see growing so copiously around here on my way here from Peterborough, those are all wind-pollinated crops. They don't require any insects because uh, wind is the agent. Their pollen is light and it is very, very bountiful. Okay, and so it gets spread around the universe, and some of it lands on the female parts of the flower, 
and that's how you get grains. So grasses and grains and many, many trees, uh, deciduous hardwoods and conifers are being pollinated. The other group of pollinators, the other pollination agent is insects. And there are other insects that do pollination besides bees, but bees are the quintessential uh, pollinator. Now, anybody want to hazard a guess why? There are basically two reasons. Anybody want to speak? This will be my Q&A. Anybody want to hazard a guess why bees, as a group, are better pollinators than anything else? Yes, sir? Yeah. What was that? We want to know why. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well me to tell you why. You know, when I, I went to teacher's college at um, University of Western Ontario, and one of the things they taught me was a Socratic question, you know, where the teacher stands up there and asks a question, a pointed question, in order to pull the answer of the audience. You guys are all operating. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I shall continue, and I shall be the fountain of all knowledge in this room. <laughs> so bees are wonderful pollinators for two reasons. The first one is that they visit flowers. Okay, so you can't be a pollinator if you don't hang out on flowers. So you can't be a pollinator if you live in the soil or you never go to flowers. And the reason they go to flowers is to get pollen and nectar. And the other reason they're really good pollinators is it should be pretty obvious from this. I'm having a real um, problem with that. Not having enough hands. Um, it should be pretty obvious from this picture. Bees are hairy. As a matter of fact, the definition of a bee is that it has four hairs on it. So, you know, if you were going to talk to um, an entomologist and you were going to have an erudite conversation, he would say, or she would say, uh, well, the difference between bees and other hymenopters is that bees have four hairs. Okay, well, when you look at a bee, you can't see that they're forked. But what four hairs do is they create places for gathering pollen. The pollen gets caught in the forks. And bees have forked hairs all over their bodies. Uh, some have more than others, um, but all of them have forked hairs. So you can see a bee here that's just covered in, and this is, sun, this is a sunflower, and it's just covered in sunflower pollen. Pollen that is moved by insects is heavy and oily. So it doesn't cause you allergies because it's not being blown around in the wind. Okay, so golden rod doesn't cause you hay fever. That's ragweed that's blooming at the same time as causing you hay fever. The other thing I like to do before I start talking about everything else is to remind people why they care about pollinators. Um, and I like to start with this, this picture here. Because I want us to have the big picture before we come to the self-centered picture. And that picture represents what other creatures eat. So I don't know about you, but I don't eat mountain ash. That's a picture of mountain ash berries. Uh, mountain ash and many, many other berries that are growing uh, in our natural environment are eaten by creatures other than human beings. And those berries are actually the result of pollination by insects. Okay, so there's a whole world of non-humans depending upon insects for pollination and for food production. For human beings, a lot of our oils, the cooking oils that we consume that are not olive oils because they don't come from here, but the cooking oils that come from here, they depend upon pollination from bees. So you can thank bees every time you have a french fry. <laughs> Another common place that people are very familiar with is all these colorful fruits and vegetables, including flowers, because you can't have flowers unless you have the seed to plant them. All those plants that you plant in your garden, you grow them from seed, that seed is the result of pollination by insects on for the most part. So I, I say to people, if you look at your plate and you see something colorful on your plate, that is the result of insect pollination. And the last thing is, if you eat meat, so I'm not talking about chickens here, but I'm talking about any kind of ruminant, so uh, cows or sheep or um, goats, if you eat meat or you drink their milk, you can be uh, thankful to pollinators because they live on a diet of hay or, or a hay product of silage or so forth. And hay is actually grown from seed, which is set by native pollinators, by the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. Uh, bee. The alfalfa leaf cutter bee is responsible for making seeds in alfalfa. 
Okay, so this is a very important uh, part of our economy. As a matter of fact, we, we don't understand how important it is. Most of this seed is actually grown out west, and then we buy the seed and we plant it. Okay, so what I'm trying to do today is I'm trying to change our focus, not because this bee, the honey bee, is bad, it's not bad, um, but I'm trying to change our focus away from this one species. We have one species of, of bee that takes up all the press in Ontario. I want us to think about the 400 species of bees that we have in Ontario that nobody knows anything about. Um, so that's what I'm going to try and do today. Okay, so I'm going to just go briefly through bees. Um, I usually give a talk that's about an hour and a half long about bees, but I'm not going to do that because it's just a short introduction. So, some native bees live in small colonies. So when we think of honeybees, we think of colonies, we think of honey, we think of stinging, that kind of stuff. Well, some native bees do live in colonies, and those ones are the bumblebees. So you guys are all familiar with fuzzy bumblebees. These are two very common bumblebees the tricolored bumblebee and the common eastern bumblebee. Uh, you'll probably see both of them uh, now that you know what they look like. And they live in small colonies, which means they have a queen, and they have workers, and they have males. Just like uh, honeybees do. Their colonies, however, don't reach the tens of thousands, they reach the hundreds. However, most of the bees in the universe, so about, about 10, species, or 10 to 15 species of bumblebees, the rest of them, of those 400, are actually solitary bees. And what does it mean to be, mean to be a solitary bee? So this is a life cycle here, and I put it up here not to bore you to tears, but to explain to you um, how sol sol solitary bees live. So this is an adult female solitary bee, and you can recognize she's a female because she's collecting pollen, and she's also collecting nectar. And she's already mated. And she is a ground nesting bee. So she's made a tunnel in the ground, and at the bottom of the tunnel, she's made a cell which she's lined with an impermeable substance, and she's dumping all of the pollen that she collects in here. And when she's got enough pollen to please herself, she lays an egg on that piece of pollen, on that pollen ball, and then she caps over the cell. And there's no more contact between her and her offspring. The offspring hatches, you get a larva, the larva goes through five instars and becomes a pupa and actually spends most of its life as a pupa. So it's not an adult for most of its life, it's a pupa for most of its life. So if we were thinking about 12 months here, this would be about a two month or three month period and this would be the remaining part. This part takes about two weeks. Okay, so you can see that native bees actually spend most of their time not as adults. That's very different um, <coughs> So this is an example of what a native bee nest entrance looks like. It's just a hole in the ground about the size of a pencil. If you could go down the hole like Alice in Wonderland, you would find at the bottom a cell. There's the, there's the pollen that she's put in there, and there's the larva. That larva is just about ready to uh, pupate. And I, uh, as you know, I live up near Peterborough in Lakefield, and I work sometimes looking for bees on this particular farm, and the, every one of these flags represents a bee nest in this farm. This is a pumpkin farm, and that, those bee nests uh, represent pumpkin or squash bee nest holes. So you can see that you can get quite an aggregation of bee nests in one place. And that's what the bee nests look like a main tunnel, and then side shafts. Okay, and the, bee, the female bee lives in her nest, but the male bee does not. So some examples of ground nesting bees, this is a polyctic bee, it's a tiny little bee, that bee looks like it's huge, but it's actually a couple of grains of rice long. That's, and it's bright green, the polyctic bees are all metallic colored bees, or black bees, and they're tiny. That's a ground nesting bee. This is a group of bees, not one particular. These are squash bees. Any pumpkin or squash growers in the audience? Yes, I wonder. Welcome. Pumpkins and squashes have a wonderful relationship with this particular bee. This is the squash bee, and it is responsible for most of the pollination of pumpkins and squashes. 
squash, and it's not a honeybee, it's a native bee. This is another bee called Polides, and Polides is also a ground nesting bee, and it lives in sandy soils. Now, not all solitary bees live in the ground. Some of them in stems, and this is a, a picture of a bee that is living in an artificial stem. And this is a mason bee, and it's called a mason bee because this is one cell, this is another cell, and she builds walls to separate one cell from another. She builds those walls out of mud. And here you have pollen, an egg, and a wall. Pollen, an egg, and a wall. Pollen, an egg, and she's laying. And this is an example of the same mason bee. This is the blue orchard bee. And if you guys have orchards down here, this bee is very, very important in orchards because it's an excellent pollinator of all orchard crops. It's only around in the spring when orchards are in bloom, and it's much more efficient than honeybees for the job. Um, so this would be the wall, the mud wall. That would be a pupa, and the top of the mud wall. This is in my greenhouse blazing at my house. Um, these bees didn't survive because of the uh, excessive moisture and heat in the place that they chose to live. Another kind of bee that lives in stems is the leaf cutter bee. And the leaf cutter bee is very important, for, I told you, for alfalfa of uh, uh, seed production. There are many, many kinds of alfalfa, uh, many, many kinds of, of leaf cutter bees. And it's called a leaf cutter bee because it cuts circles out of leaves and then it lines its nest with those uh, leaf cuts, with those leaf um, cuttings. This bee is called a wool carter bee, and it's called a wool. Anybody recognize that plant? Any gardeners in the room? Lanthier. That's lanthier. So you see these parts, see how it's all woolly, and then you see these parts that are kind of green and not woolly? That's because this bee, this wool carter bee, has shaved this leaf in these patches, and she's gathering up the wool. And the reason she's doing that is to line her nest, like a baby's blanket. Pretty hard to do, right? How can you not love baby to do that? No, you don't get any honey. There's no honey. These bees produce zero honey. They're not honey bees. They're pollinators. That's what they are. Some bees are specialist bees. Now, I showed you a picture before of the squash bee, and this is the squash bee. And it is a prime example of a specialist bee that's important to agriculture because this bee only pollinates one type of crop, and that's pumpkins and squashes. Pumpkins and squashes are all the same species of crop, um, and this bee is the one that pollinates them best. And I would be very interested to know if you guys have this bee down in this neck of the woods, and my guess is that you do. So a specialist bee is one that only goes with one plant. Most bees are, in fact, generalists. Okay, so now you kind of know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about native bees. Now I want to switch gears and I want to talk about neonicotinoids. Okay, so I want to, to set the scene. I want us to understand how we got to where we are. So pre-1990s, we have this. These are the the uh, insecticides that we had available to us in agriculture, um, carbamates, organophosphates, and synthetic pyrethroids. And if any, is, are there any farmers in the room? Anybody who wants to comment about these guys? These guys are nasty chemicals. They're very nasty chemicals. They're very toxic, not just to insects, but to human beings. Um, they're contact insecticides, but the thing about them is that they don't last a long time. They don't hang around. So they, they're not, it's like getting a punch in the face, and then you get up, and uh, you go for, you're either dead or you get up. But if somebody else comes along after the punch has been, has been delivered, that person doesn't get a punch in the face. Okay, so it's sort of like a, it's a one-time deal. Of, if the insect happens to be in the, in the field when this stuff is put on, and let's say for three days, then the insect will get killed, okay, for sure. But uh, if the insect comes after that period, it won't get killed. Okay, so you sort of understand these are, these, you must come in contact directly with the spray product during the time when it is actually active, these guys. And um, then somebody had a really good idea. 
Well, first of all, oh, yeah. so most of our, our pesticides in Ontario, most of them are either highly toxic or moderately toxic to bees. Nobody had any argument about that. That is not something that is controversial at all. Um, it's just that we are um, using more pesticides, but it's hidden. In our pesticides, are starting to become hidden. So if you look at this data, I took this data from um, well, the Omacra website, and you can see what's happening. So you have this, you have this very large loading of insecticides in 1983, and it starts to decrease. And that's all good. That's really good. Does anybody know why it was decreasing? Yes. But also because we had a really active, as a matter of fact, we had a really first class integrated pest management program in Ontario through the Ministry of Agriculture. They had a lot of people out in the fields helping farmers to identify pests and to know when to apply insecticides. And so insecticides were being applied when they were needed, where they were needed. And by doing that, we went from 8.7 million kilograms to 5.2 million kilograms. This is still a pretty horrific. This is active ingredient. This is not um, palatine insecticide. Then what happened is in around 2003, and uh, we, we're still going down to 4.2. But there's a problem here because what happened is we switched types of insecticide, and Omafra was no longer keeping track of seed treatments. Have you all heard about seed treatments? This is when insecticides are not applied by the farmers, but are applied directly on the seed by the seed companies. So the farmer buys the seed and it's already got a coating of insecticide on it. And that insecticide was never included in numbers. So magically, we were suddenly, we dropped a million kilograms of active ingredients from 1998 to 2003. In here, in this period of time, we lost all of our integrated pest management capacity in Ontario. Now you can see that we're starting to creep up again. And I think that if we look at the, there will be new numbers shortly, I think in 2014 there will be new numbers. I expect that number to be going way up um, in conversation with people who know. Because now the neonicotinoids are going to start to be included in that group. Uh, in the, in the, Unfortunately, Southern and Western Ontario are the biggest users of insecticides uh, in Ontario, and that's just reflective of the fact that this is where agriculture happens. So up in my neck of the woods, there is agriculture, but it's mostly pasture. It's mostly pasturing of beef, and so our insecticide use is much lower. And when you go to Northern Ontario, well, things go really down because there isn't much agriculture at all. So that little gap that I showed you on that slide, that's the gap where systemic insecticides were introduced into Ontario. And systemic insecticides are really ama an amazing idea. I'll be the first person to say that. They seem like a great idea. The person who thought them up was actually brilliant. That person or those persons were brilliant for several reasons. And I'd like to give them credit because I'm a big fan of smartness, of intelligence, of using your brain. And the problem is that sometimes using your brain and not paying attention to the downside of using your brain is where human beings get into trouble. The so first thing, neonicotinoids were developed and they were brand new. They were something completely different. So guess what? They were patentable. If you can patent a product, you can make big bucks off of it. And okay, so that was a great idea. Check. Okay, there's a business model here. The second thing was they were toxic. They worked. When you apply those things to insect to pest insects and they came in contact with them, they died. Check. It works. Furthermore, it was persistent. It wasn't like those old insecticides that you apply them. And then three weeks later, you had to apply them again. These insecticides you applied once on seed. And then you walked away. And you didn't have to do it again. That's really great for the environment, because you don't have to make so many passes on the soil. 
You don't have to use up fossil fuel. It is a really good idea. And I have to give people credit for having a really good idea. The other thing was that it's targeted. It meant that nothing that wasn't attacking the plant or eating the plant was going to be killed, right? Because it wasn't applied willy-nilly in airplanes across the universe. It was applied to seed, or was it, it was applied in, you know, very close to the plant. It seemed like a great idea. The problem was, the problem is, that it's targeted, yes, but it's also wide spectrum. That means it kills every insect it needs. Okay? It's not just the pest insects it kills. And they forgot or closed their eyes or wanted not to know that pollinators would eat the plants. Because that's what pollinators do. They don't eat the leaves, they eat the pollen and they eat the nectar. The other thing about this, this class of chemicals is it has a low toxicity to mammals. And what I mean by that is actually, I, I'd like to, to kind of qualify that statement. Because we don't really know what it does to mammals over the long term. What we do know is that if you were to get the same dose as an insect, a one-time dose as an insect, it wouldn't do anything to you. And it would kill the insect. That's what they mean by low toxicity to mammals. What they don't mean is that if you were exposed to neonicotinoids over the rest of your life at the same rate as an insect, what it would do for you? Okay, so that's two different, those are two different questions. And the other brilliant marketing scheme that went along with these products was that they were marketed as just in case. They were marketed as insurance against <coughs> pests. So what happened is just at the time when the Ontario government was no longer really involved in, in advising um, farmers because there's no budget for it anymore to hire the people to do it. There was a product that came on the market that said, well, you don't really need advisors because we have an insurance policy for you. You just put this stuff on your crop, and if you have a pest, it's taken care of. And if you don't have a pest, it does no harm. And that's the model that all of agriculture in Ontario and across the world fell into. In 2009, the value of neonicotinoids across the world was $2,632,000,000. Now, I don't even know what that means. I mean, I have no idea what that means. That is a huge number. It is big business. It is big business, and so it is. there is going to obviously be a fight to keep it, because it is an income generator. I won't say any more. Okay, I want you guys to be um, educated. So there are four basic, I mean there are some other ones too, but there are four <coughs> basic major active ingredients in neonatal. So neonicotinoids is not one insecticide. It's a group or a class of insecticides. And the, the older ones are imidacloprid and clothianidin. The newer ones are dinitofurin and thiamethoxin. Thiamethoxin, when it gets out into the environment, just turns into clothianidin. Okay, so um, essentially, this becomes this. Now, think of yourself, if you're not a farmer, then you have to put on your imagination have right now and think of yourself as somebody who is your farmer, you've got a million things to do, and you go to the feed shop or the feed store or the ag chemical shop and you say, I need a product to do this. And you get given a product to do that and you go home and you use it and it works because you don't have a problem. Are you going to pay attention to what to these names? No, you're absolutely not. You know, when you go and you buy something for your headache, you know what that actual stuff is, or do you know what's called Tylenol? You know what's called Tylenol, right? You don't know what it is. It's the same thing with farmers. So when we, when I talk to farmers about neonicotinoids, I have to tell them these are the active ingredients, and these are some of the brand names. Don't you love these names? And just imagine being a farmer or you know, being a farmer or a golf course owner or a nursery owner, 
who is trying to figure out which one of the toys he uses or she uses is a, a neonicotinoid. I mean, there's, a, there's the names of the active ingredients, and then there's the names of all the uh, brand names, and they're not the same thing. It amounts to a lot of confusion. So there's a whole education piece that has to happen, and I don't really know who is supposed to be doing it. Now, neonicotinoids are systemic, and what that means is that we apply, uh, neonicotinoids are applied in many ways, but one of the ways that they're applied is as a seed coating. They're also applied as a soil drench. They're also applied as a foliar spray. Okay. But let's start with a seed, uh, a seed coat. So this is coated corn, and coated corn, the neonicotinoid then moves into the whole corn plant. So it gets into the stalk, it gets into the leaves, it gets into the tassel, that's where the pollen is, and it gets into the ear of the corn, because that's where the female part of the flower is. And so it ends up infesting the whole plant. That's what's so great about systemic insecticides, is because they don't just stay in one part of the plant, they're in the whole confounded thing. Now, if you're in, this is a, a squash flower. Okay, so squash also has neonicotinoids associated with it. And you can buy coated squash seed. And then it will get into the pollen and into the nectar, which is down here. And then this is a squash bee. I don't know if you can see it. It's hard to detect it because it's so covered in squash pollen. It looks like it looks like squash pollen itself. And it is going to get covered in that stuff, and it's going to be feeding it, feeding it to its larva. Remember those pictures where the larva are eating pollen? Well, if it's eating tainted pollen, we have to ask ourselves what is happening. The reason I'm not saying, I'm not telling you what is happening is because we frankly don't know. Because we don't study native bees. We study only honeybees. The other thing that I'd like to mention is this. And this is just a, something to put in the back of your mind. Because I'm not saying that it is so. I am suggesting that it could be so. We don't know. And that is, when you're eating a cob of corn, you are ingesting neonicotinoids. And I don't know what happens over the long term in your body with constant ingestion of neonicotinoids. I don't know the answer to that question, but it is a great concern to me, so much so that I don't eat corn. That's my stance on it. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with corn growers. It's just that I'm, I'm really worried about this particular thing. Uh, corn is in many, 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 many products. <clears throat> So just in case you thought that you could get away from the noise by not eating corn, the bad news is that you can't. Neonicotinoids are registered on every crop in Ontario. And I just made a list here for you because I wanted you to understand. I put this pretty picture of herbs up here. Because unless you're buying your herbs from a small farmer or, or an organic farmer, those herbs are very likely to have been treated with neonicotinoids. When you buy Trees, when you buy Christmas trees, they are, are sprayed with neonicotinoids. When you buy ornamentals for your garden, they are sprayed with neonicotinoids. Uh, vegetables, field crops, I mean, we just go on and on and on. This is a very small list. The list is actually, it's about, I have an incomplete list given to me by the macro, and it has got 79 crops on it. Okay, so I am, um, I'm telling you this because I, I don't want you to be blissfully unaware. The other thing I want you to be aware of is that there is no doubt in anybody's mind that neonicotinoids are bad for pollinators and they're bad for insects. Because it's on the label of the insecticide. It's, it's actually, I, I, have a, I have a copy of every label of neonicotinoid insecticides at home. You know, this is how I spend my time. It's really great fun. Everything is like side labels. Yeah. Anybody want to send me to Hawaii or something? <laughs> so, anyway, um, so I have this thick file right, of insecticide labels, and I read them. And this is just one of them for you to see. Okay, so let's start here. Environmental hazards. Toxic to aquatic organisms. 
birds, small wild mammals, and non-target terrestrial plants. Observe buffer zones specified under directions for these. Okay, so no reason. The people who make this stuff are not arguing about this, because it's on their label. Toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment, drift, or residues on flowering crops or weeds. Because guess what? It doesn't just stay on the crops, it ends up in the weeds because it travels through the ground because it's highly uh, uh, movable in water. Do not apply this product to flowering crops or weeds if bees are visiting the treatment area. Minimize spray drift to reduce harmful effects on bees in habitats close to the application site. They're obviously aware of how this stuff moves in the environment. Toxic to certain beneficial insects. Minimize spray drift to reduce harmful, harmful effects on beneficial insects in habitats next to the application site, such as hedgerows or woodland. You know, I don't think we need any more research on that. I mean, they've already said it. This is not me that's saying it. It's not the government that's saying it. This is the makers of the product that are saying it. And then this is uh, clutch is prothianidin, and that's one of the active ingredients of uh, neonicotinoids. Prothianidin is persistent and may carry over. It is recommended that any products containing prothianidin not be used in areas treated with this product during the previous season. Okay, so let me tell you about this. This is the thing that concerns me a great deal. So some people grow corn and then they grow soybean. That's really great. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to rotate corn and soybean. Soybean is a legume and corn is a grass. The only problem is that you apply neonicotinoids to both. So guess what happens? It is carried over from one year and then you apply it again and you keep getting more and more and more insecticide, this, this neonicotinoid, in your soil because you're applying it to the same field every year, even though it's a different crop. You get my concern? 